chapter. So let's move to Kristen Pogreba Brown, um, who is um, an assistant professor, actually moving to associate professor now. I've just got tenure um, in epidemiology in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the Melanie Zuckerman College of Public Health. And then we'll try to get Cecilia on a little later. Thanks, Frank. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Oh, I guess I have to stay in front of the mic, don't I? Um, <clears throat> so my talk today is going to be a little bit different from some of the other talks um, that we've had. So traditionally, my um, One Health research has been in food safety, so I work a lot with Dr. Cooper and Dr. Verhoogstraight, um, but COVID really uh, threw my career into a different path for a few years, and so I have been mostly doing that. So I wanted to talk about a different project um, that I've been working on. So one of the collaborators that I have within One Health is the Pima Animal Care Center. So how many people here own a pet at home? This is pretty typical of a One Health crowd. Um, my One Health students are pretty, I asked everybody what the, um, their silver lining of the pandemic was and everyone pretty much said, I got to spend more time with my pets at home. So um, <clears throat> pets are a huge part of our lives. Um, I actually just Googled it and there's about 1.3 billion um, just cats and dogs in the United States alone and so shelters are one of those areas where we have a lot of of kind of back and forth between the shelter and the community and they really have a lot of influence on how we kind of work with our pets in our lives so i've been collaborating with pac through my one health course for several years so some of the things i'm going to talk about today um, very quickly are going to be the projects that we worked with with them and then some research opportunities that we have going forward. And if you think there isn't money in animals, you would be wrong. There's a lot of money in companion animals and a lot of research interests. Oops. Okay, so the very first time that I talked to people about incorporating One Health with PAC, I got a lot of, well, why are you doing this with the animal shelter? It didn't really make sense. Like, what does the pound have to do with One Health? And actually, the um, animal shelters for a very long time have really been moving in this direction. So a lot of like what doctors, um, the, the vets that we just heard from earlier today, um, talked about there's a lot of, of holistic approach to animal care that involves both the people that are part of their lives and then the environment with they're in. And so several years ago, they started a um, kind of a movement called HAS, which is the Human Animal Support Services. And really the ultimate goal of HAS is to keep pets with their human families. Um, but they realized that the way that they needed to do that is to actually provide support and provide an infrastructure in which that was possible. So some of the examples that we think of when we talk about One Health, um, and this is great because I have my students who are actually um, did this work, just walked in. Um, so some of the, um, the work, so I think probably bi-directional is probably a better word than bi bilateral, but you know, we talked about zoonotic disease transmission. So clearly we worry about um, disease that happens within a shelter. Some of you might have just seen that PAC had a recent scare with strep zoo, which is an extremely infectious disease among dogs. But we do know that there are diseases that can be transmitted um, to animals from people, more commonly from, from animals to people. And that's something that they are constantly thinking about is how do they deal with infection control? How do they deal with outbreaks within shelter? Um, and then we also have to think about how do diseases within the community go into a shelter and then back and forth. So for instance, those animals that um, had the strep zoo exposure were um, exposed to the dog in the shelter, which then went home and exposed other dogs. So they essentially had to do an outbreak investigation, call all the people who had adopted those pets, make sure they got prophylactic um, treatments so that they, that disease wouldn't spread any further. The other thing that we think of a lot with animal shelters is occupational exposures. So occupational exposures, I think, is one 
really largely untapped area within One Health. And if you think about the people who work with animals, they have the most exposure to both the environment and the, the, the animals that they're working with and have the, the highest likelihood of having these kinds of diseases and other things come up. And it's not just um, zoonotic diseases. Um, it's things like noise. It's things like um, mental health stress and others. So there's a lot of untapped areas of research we could be looking at for this. Um, the others is how can we change the built environment of shelters to improve the mental health workers and the stress of the animals. So for those of you who've been to PAC, um, I don't know if you've ever been to the old PAC, which was this very not lovely building. It had like no windows. It was basically, you know, a box. Um, and then now their new facility is just beautiful, but it's also one of the most beautiful ones in the country and it's not really typical for a lot of shelters. So we need to think about how we can build them so that it improves the mental health of the people that are working there and it also allows for separation of animals. It's very loud in shelters when you get a lot of dogs barking and so how does that increase the stress. And so they've looked at things like if you can get a dog out of the shelter, which is why we have foster programs, it increases their adoptability because it decreases their stress. They become more um, friendly with people who are coming to potentially adopt them um, versus, you know, you can imagine if you were stuck in a cage for 12 hours in a row, which is constant noise, you probably wouldn't be in a very good mood either. Um, and then the fencing program is another example where they've looked at using this Haas model of how can we, we have, let's say we have a dog that keeps getting out of their yard, right? And so they get taken to the shelter. Instead of having to take that dog, what if we just help the owners get a fence? So again, work with the people, change the environment, keep the pets with their families. So the particular project that I'm going to talk very briefly about today is how PAC responded to COVID-19. So just like everyone else, PAC had to adapt and adjust quickly in March of 2020. Um, the pandemic in impacted intakes, adoptions, staffing, and outreach. So they decided to take um, we a One Health approach, allowed them to consider the changes in their environment and how could it impact the health of their staff and the animals. So in 2020, we were not able to do our normal project with PAC, but in 2021, uh, the students in my um, uh, graduate level one health class did a SWOT analysis, and I'm not going to be able to cover all of the work that they did today, but they really went through and looked at what were the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that the shelter had to deal with in order to get through the pandemic. And those opportunities are really things that we can be looking at as researchers. Um, so just very quickly, so some of the strengths, um, we actually have um, Friends of PAC as their kind of nonprofit arm. Um, it became very, very, um, they have a, a very strong fundraising arm. Um, and we actually have pretty decent municipal funding. And they collect a lot of data, which I will get to in a little bit, which as somebody who's an epidemiologist, I'm very interested in their data. Um, they had some partnerships with Amazon, which allowed them to get supplies. Um, and they've had very good success through their community outreach program. They have a very robust volunteer program, which we'll talk about is actually became one of their weaknesses in this, in this situation. Their pet support center is essentially a call line where people could call and ask questions. When they first started the pet support center, I talked to their director at the time and she said, you know, we anticipated a couple hundred calls, maybe a month where people would need some support and need other things. And they get about 8,000 calls a month. And so those calls are, are everything from, you know, I need to bring my animal in because I have to have surgery and I don't have anyone to watch them. So I have to turn them in as they're, and, and how can we work with people so that we can give them other opportunities or options? And then inclusive policies for anyone looking to adopt, and I can get into that more detail. Um, so the, I, I realize that I have weaknesses and I have pictures of the volunteers, which seems a little harsh, but the reason why it's because many of the volunteers at the time are retired, are elderly, and that means that during COVID, 
they were the ones that couldn't come, right? We didn't want, they, they PAC told them, please don't come. We don't wanna worry about your exposure. And so staffing shortages did become a major issue during this time period. And um, the other issue is their data system um, is not particularly user-friendly. I had a student work, try to work with their data um, in this last year and was basically told by a statistician it was the ugliest data set he'd ever seen. Um, and, and so part of that means that we need to work with them so that there's no point in collecting a lot of data if there's no way to actually use it. So that's the first point on my opportunities, right? There's a lot of data that is, is collected, so there's a lot of opportunities that we can use to analyze that data and then give that information back to the shelters to be able to make different policy decisions and also then to further some additional research questions. Um, looking at additional um, community partners. What's interesting is a lot of donor, donors donated a lot of money early on um, for fear of COVID and other things, um, but COVID also allowed them to, in, in talking to the people at the shelter, and we did these very kind of in-depth um, kind of interviews with them, um, they allowed, they felt like they actually had the ability to have better customer service with people. So they could have these kind of one-on-ones, they had drive up adoption events, they could share um, you know, videos of the pets online, and it allowed them to have a little bit more interaction instead of kind of constantly having people in the shelter. Um, less animals and people in the shelter appeared to decrease both human and animal anxiety because it was far less noisy, um, and which again, decreased the stress. So how can those, how can that be fostered going forward? I'm just looking at your daughter's hair. Um, and then the threats, um, the biggest one is mental health for caregivers and animals. So this was a really stressful time for all of us, um, but trying to think about somebody who's um, who's working in a shelter, even normal circumstances has a high mental health um, burden on them. Um, just like we saw, we have seen in um, pediatrics, where we've seen a decrease in routine vaccinations, we're actually seeing a decrease in routine vaccinations in um, dogs and cats because people just didn't take their pets to the vet during this time period. And so they're getting um, pets to the shelter that have these diseases that they normally would be vaccinated against. And so this is something that they're going to have to start thinking through um, and trying to do more um, vaccine events. Um, we also, um, so I talked about the environment from the built environment, but the other thing that happened in uh, last year, you know, many of you remember in Tucson, last year was a crazy monsoon season, right? We had a lot of rain, we had a lot of storms. And I, in talking to the director, she said every time she heard the thunder going, she knew that there was just going to be an influx of pets because um, animals also often get freaked out during storms and they, they run. And so every time there's a large storm, PAC gets a big influx of, of animals that have essentially run, they kind of get lost, they don't know where they're going, and then they, um, they end up in the shelter. And so um, when we're in Arizona, we have to think about that during the monsoon season, um, and then increased property damage with um, runaway pets. So, okay. so some of the key points that we found in doing our assessment with them is that shelter organizations played a major role in keeping pets with their families throughout the pandemic. Um, we didn't, we saw a lot more adoptions, but we also saw intakes. And I think there were a lot of stories in the media that talked about like, oh, people are going back to work now. And so now the shelters are getting a lot more animals because people don't want them anymore. And that really doesn't tell the story of what was really happening. What was really happening is people were facing eviction from not having um, worked for a very long time. Um, if you move into a new place, if you try to find a rental, and oftentimes the pet fee that they charge with a rental is going to be several hundred dollars, which is prohibitive for a lot of families. So thinking of ways that um, they could allow people to kind of stay with their pets was something that they worked with. Um, those curbside shelter services had a positive impact on reducing both human and animal stress anxiety levels. Um, the other thing that they found is new pet owners may need training on kind of finding that right balance. So there's a lot of like pandemic puppies that have never really had um, outside experience with other people, other animals, 
and they've just had their pet around or their person around them for 24/7, um, and so there needs to be some training on how we can get our pets better acclimated to be back out in the world with us. Um, the communities tended to step up when challenged to support their local um, operation. Excuse me, shelter operations. Um, Tucson actually has one of the largest foster organizations in the country, and foster families really stepped up a lot during the pandemic. Um, and then while PAC had um, some loss in volunteer capacity, they continued to serve and support the community. So I just want to end on some other examples of One Health research opportunities with PAC um, and or any shelter that you happen to be work with, Humane Society, others. So um, some of the zoonotic diseases that we've talked a lot about, have those changed with COVID? Um, how will they be different as the impacts of climate change occur? So um, while valley fever is not transmissible between people and pets, it's something that affects both people and pets, and we know that it's probably going to change with climate change. Um, what areas of the community are animals coming from with specific diseases? So can we look at hot spots using the data, you know, getting their data to a point where it can be analyzed and then using it um, to see, do we see similar disease clusters in people or wildlife in these areas? Um, how can we improve occupational health of staff and volunteers um, to reduce environmental exposures? What are the health benefits of pet ownership for vulnerable populations? And I, um, specifically people who are experiencing homelessness, this is a big um, challenge within the shelter world, but I think a lot of debate has happened and, and we've pretty much ended up on the side of it's generally better than, um, than not. Um, and then how can environments be adapted to enable these relationships? Um, so for instance, if you are someone who's experiencing homelessness and you're looking for a cooling center in Arizona, those cooling centers are not available to pets. So if you have a dog, your dog either has to stay outside while you go inside or you just don't go. We have one domestic abuse shelter in this, in this city that allows animals. A lot of times people will not leave those situations because of their pets. So those are ways that we can change policies in order to enable people to stay with their pets and to help the people that are in those situations. And then can foster programs be used in long term care facilities to improve health care for patients with dementia and Alzheimer's and this is another project I was working on with a, another faculty member at Mezgoff. So this is my last pitch if you are interested in being a foster. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen.